I continue with energy. I just showed you the stress strain relation. Hooke's law, it's called Hooke's law uh, for isotropic elastic materials. We will see later something which is not elastic. I come back to that later. Now, we did have so far displacements. We have from that one, we derived the strain tensor. Via the material law, we now can calculate the stress from a strain. Okay. And what is missing now is how much work do we have to do in order to deform an object? And how much work do we get back if a deformed object goes back to its original state? And this is elastic energy. This one you can put in by work and we get it back when we release the force. With the force we work, taking away the force, the energy will come back. Okay, now energy is the remaining item. The, one of the few things which I still have to tell you about. Okay, now work. The total work which you have to apply, the total work, that is why it's an integral here, from the original to the end configuration, is the force times displacement in every time step. So that makes an integral force displacement. And this is the bar on which I apply the force. The displacement is U that you, you can use to calculate the strain as a consequence of the force, as I showed you before. This is a very simple case, so the calculation will be very short, many zeros in your tensors. Okay, now the force itself and the displacement, we see that the displacement and the force follow a linear relationship. That is what linear elasticity is about. So the force displacement law is linear, and the work, you remember, energy or work is calculated as the integral over the, under this curve. So the dashed area is the total elastic work. Okay, and that one, this integral, if we integrate over u, and if we insert f, which is proportional to u, then it's an integral over u du, and that one gives us one half u du, one half u square, displacement square. Okay, that's simple integration. Now, at the end, we want to relate this to the stress force definition and the strain definition and bring those two together and see how that what that has to do with energy now. Okay, so that's stress definition. This is strain definition. If you insert the definitions into the relation, then we get something like work slash energy is one half times area times stress one one times length times strain one one. So that's what you get when you insert the definitions. Okay, and in shorter form, the area times the length is the volume. Okay, so we have one half, that one comes from the integral. We have sigma one one and we have epsilon one one. And that is the work that much work you have to insert. And this is a superposition, a, a multiplication of stress and strain. Before we had the relation between stress and strain, stress on the left-hand side, strain on the right-hand side. Now we have a stress multiplied with a strain. Okay, and this was the total work to be done. If you divide the total work by the volume, it disappears. And what we have is the specific internal elastic energy with uh, designated as a small pi in contrast to the capital pi which we had before. And that's just one half stress strain. Okay, and this one is true for this one configuration where we stretch the bar in the one direction only. And you can guess what I do next. I will show you how to do this for the full tensorial general configuration. Now, first, for shear, you can guess it will look like this stress, strain, relation. Okay, if you do that for all the possible possibilities, we have the one direction, we have the two direction stretch, we have the three direction stretch, we have the shear in one, two, one, three, and two, three. 
And if we replace now the gamma, which was not a tensorial component by the two epsilon, where epsilon are the tensorial components and using symmetry, uh, we can write the, the specific internal elastic energy as a sum of the three diagonal terms and something which looks like a matrix, but it's just summing up all these nine terms. So total elastic energy. And what I want to achieve with this is I want to have the total elastic, specific elastic energy uh, in index notation. And when you look at all these indices, these many indices, these many terms are in index notation again, index notation with the summation convention, again, very much shorter with two dummy indices, I sum, summed over and J summed over, and all the terms have the one half, so we can use this. Some terms are just used two times because of the symmetry, they are not different, but I was writing it up this way such that it's more evident how we get the index notation summation. Okay, so specific energy remains a stress strain relation, a stress strain multiplication. The one half remains as we had it before in the simple example. And if now we would talk about one one, then this one would be only sigma 1, 1, this one would be only sig epsilon 1, 1, and we have achieved what we had before for, for the special case of a stretched bar only. Now we have it for the general case for any type of stress and strain. So the total energy which is needed for deforming an object, and often engineering work is about energy and use of energy, the total strain, stress, internal stress, we can sorry, not the total, the specific uh, energy we achieve using this formula. And if we want to achieve the total energy, then we have to integrate over the whole object where we are talking about. Okay, and that's what I do here. So specific stress, specific stress integral over the whole volume gives us the total, not stress, I'm talking nonsense. Stress multiplied with strain gives us specific energy, gives us the total energy when we integrate over the whole volume of the object. Now, this has a few other consequences. When we insert Hooke's law now, we know stress as a function of strain, so we could insert Hooke's law here that would give us something with strain, strain, only strain on the right hand side, so we could express it as a function of strain only. If we insert the inverse Hooke's law strain here, then we would have energy as a function of stress only. So here it's mixed, but you can express it as only stress or strain. In the quadratic, in a quadratic expression, which you achieve from this, you, you will see that energy is quadratic. Energy is always positive in that sense. Something quadratic, if I take something to the power two, it implies that I get a positive value. Energy inserted is a positive relation and that characterizes elastic materials. Now, if I apply stress in one direction or another direction, if I apply strain in one direction or another direction, uh, that one could lead to a positive, to an increase of energy or to a decrease of energy. So changes of energy, what I do to the object, whether I need energy, whether I need to apply work or whether I get work back, that one can have positive and negative signs. But the material relation implies a positivity for most materials. Okay, now energy, specific energy turns out to be invariant for coordinate system transformation. And that is because the specific energy is a scalar. EL are not indices, it's just a placeholder for elastic. So the specific elastic energy is a scalar. Even though we have two tensors here, uh, a scalar is coordinate system transformation independent. So elastic energy is an invariant. It's an invariant of a machine or an object inside a machine or a body which we deform. So invariants are good <laughs> because you don't have to worry about coordinate transformation with them. Okay, and next element is uh, the specific energy has two contributions. And you remember what are the two possibilities. I can have change of length. I can have change of energy. Change of length in all three directions translates to change of energy. 
and I can have change of shape, change of angles, and that one I take out for a while. I only want to focus on volumetric, isotropic, hydrostatic stress, so mean stress, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and I want to talk about volume change. So now the first invariant of stress and the first invariant of strain come together. They talk to each other and they make the isotropic contribution to the specific elastic energy. So hydrostatic stress multiplied with volume change gives us change of energy. And this one is a, is a scalar relation. There are only scalars, there is no tensor here. And this is again simpler. It's using the first invariant divided by three of stress and it's using the first invariant of strain. And that's it. So that part, the isotropic part, is easy to interpret. It's the energy due to volume change when I applied a certain stress. Now, in Hooke's law, we have seen that the volume change is related to this as epsilon kk, first invariant of strain, is related to the first invariant of stress. And here comes the bulk modulus, which I promised before. This one, C, is E divided by 3, 1 minus 2 nu. Okay, so C is in the denominator. Moduli are in the denominator in this relation. Okay. Now, when, you, when we fill this in, then we are using the material parameters in this relation. On the left-hand side, we have specific volume change energy, hydrostatic stress, volume change, insert the Hooke's law here, that's coming from directly above. Okay, and what you get at the end of the day, uh, with a little bit of abbreviations, we get sigma HH, sigma KK. So this is the quadratic stress which I mentioned, and sigma HH and sigma KK are the first invariant of the stress, both of them. Only I cannot use KK and KK again. KK is a dummy index pair. I don't want to use the same one again. Otherwise, I get four indices, which are the same, and that's only confusing. You just have to remember that sigma KK is the placeholder for the trace of strain, uh, stress, and sigma HH is the same thing. So I have the sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 multiplied with itself squared. Okay, so... The isotropic elastic energy, specific isotropic elastic energy, is also a scalar, so it's also independent of coordinate transformation. Okay, and what remains to be finished up with? And that is all the energy which is not related to volume change. All the energy which is not related to volume change is the total energy minus the volume change energy. And that one, when you insert it and calculate it, I don't do it, uh, gives us prefactor, gives us 1 plus nu over E, which looks like the shear modulus, which we had before, actually. Okay, and we have the stress eigenvalues difference squared for the 1, 2, for the 1, 3, for the 2, 3. You remember, this one was shear stresses in certain directions. Sigma 1 minus sigma 3 was the maximum shear stress. This one was another shear stress. Okay, so these are shear stresses squared, maximum shear stresses squared. We sum up all three possibilities in three-dimensional space. Okay, and we have something like an inverse shear modulus here. So we have shear stresses squared are giving the shape change specific elastic energy. Here we have normal stresses squared, which give us the volume change energy. Shear stresses give us the shape change energy. Okay, and this leads to the deviatoric stress definition, and I will uh, repeat myself one or two times, but I, before I go to deviatoric stress after a one minute break again, uh, I just want to tell you, take a look in the break for the invariants. This one is one of the invariants. This one is not the first invariant because we have used that one here already. This one actually is related to the second invariant plus a little bit more, which I will show you on the next slides. Uh, one, two minutes break now.